Good morning, friends. This is Pastor Lori from First UMC in Kirksville, and it's wonderful to gather with you today on this Tuesday in May. We sometimes ask that question, how is it with your soul? And as I'm thinking about that at this particular season, I'm thinking about transitions. Now, these past couple weeks in worship, we have heard some of the transition stories from the Bible, right? We had Ascension, where Jesus goes with his disciples out um out into the wilderness in those post-resurrection times, he gives them final instructions about what is going on. And then right in front of their eyes, he ascends into heaven. That's the goodbye part, right? He tells them to wait in Jerusalem to receive the Holy Spirit, and then to go out and tell everybody what they have seen and heard, to witness. That chapter closes, right? As he ascends, that book is finished. And then on Sunday, we talked about the opening of the next book, when we talked about the Pentecost part of the story. And in that one, the Holy Spirit descends on the followers at in Jerusalem in a way that nobody could ignore, right? It seemed like there were tongues of fire on top of their heads. There was the sound of a rushing wind, and they were able to speak in languages that others who were traveling from far distances could understand. An amazing kind of thing. But And that was the new book that opened, right? But in between those two, there is a time in a transition that we're sometimes not very comfortable with. And that's that time in between when an ending happens and when whatever the new beginning is, because there is always a new beginning after an ending, um, and sometimes that time in between is short, sometimes it's really long, and we're not always super comfortable with what to do during that time. I was reading about that this week in the book, Praying Our Goodbyes by Joyce Roop, and she describes four things that we can do when something has ended to help make that more possible, to help that moving on go a little further and to help us move into a future. And we see some hints of that in the scriptures, how the disciples wound up doing these same kind of things. And the first one is simply recognition, naming and identifying the loss that has happened. Now, that seems like it should be easy, but sometimes it's not because not all losses are as obvious as Jesus ascending up into the sky, right? Sometimes there are losses that we're not even sure exactly how to name what has changed. We just know that something has changed and it's left us feeling unsettled. And we're not sure what to do. Now, in this story, this even happens to the disciples, right? They're standing, they're staring up into the sky. They're sort of like they're frozen in place. And it takes these heavenly visitors, folks in white who come along to name what has happened. Why do you stand staring up at the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven. And it's that act of voicing what's happened that then makes it possible for Jesus' followers to move from that spot and return to Jerusalem. So recognition is first, that naming and identifying the loss that's happening. And then the second is reflection. And in that, it is taking the time to reflect on all that has happened Um, in that relationship, in that situation, in that experience that has just ended, maybe to reflect on the way the ending itself um, played out. That can happen in an honest pouring out to God. It can happen through conversation with others. It can happen through journaling or some other type of sharing. It can even be just time to sit and think deeply on what has happened. And now we see this again with the group of Jesus's followers as they return to Jerusalem. They says they go to that room where they had been staying and that we read that they were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, a prayer that went beyond just individual prayer. And it included other followers of Jesus, his mother and his brothers. 
And the beginning of the book of Acts itself may be a kind of writing and reflection along with the book of Luke, because the author writes in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote, all, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until he was taken up into heaven. So when an ending has happened, how can you make the time to reflect? Um, reflection may involve tears. It may involve laughter. It probably will have a combination of both. It likely won't necessarily just be in one little short episode, although it might be if it's a loss that is not um, one that has impacted all sorts of areas of life. But if it's something as small, as, seemingly small, right, as your favorite checker got replaced by a self-checkout machine at the grocery store, right? You might want to just name that and reflect on, oh, that checker always had a smile for me. And we always had a good conversation about how the Cardinals were doing or something like that, right? Just to simply reflect on what that experience or that relationship had meant. So recognition and then reflection. And then the third one is ritualization. And this is using images or symbols along some kind of movement um, as a form of prayer and a way of acting out some of the emotion present within us in some kind of meaningful way. Now, the disciples had a little bit of a leg up on this one because Jesus had actually given them the beginnings of a ritual on his last night with them as they gathered around the table, right? Every time we observe communion, we remember what he did with them. And he had said as he passed the bread and the cup, do this in remembrance of me. And so anytime the disciples there in that upper room after Jesus had ascended would have gathered gathered for a meal, they would have likely done this, right? And we know this because we still do it today, right? It didn't die out. It didn't stop happening. Um, so this was part of their ritual. Now, our rituals probably won't be that involved. They may be something small. It could be as simple as... Um, for some types of endings, finding some little something that might remind us of it and setting it in a place we remember. Maybe there's a marking of um, anniversaries or days on a calendar. It could look a lot of different ways. It could be as simple as simply a remembering and a putting a hand on a heart to give thanks, right? Doesn't have to be huge, but it is best in a ritual if there's some kind of image or symbol involved. Maybe, I, I know some folks, anytime they see a dime on the ground that has fallen, that's one of their rituals to remember someone in their life who's no longer with them. Um, for some people, it's seeing a cardinal or a butterfly or some other type of something that they see, maybe a rainbow or a certain type of cloud. Um, anytime it's a really stormy day and I see a tiny little patch of blue up in the sky, I think about my great grandmother who used to have this saying that if there were enough blue in the sky to make a pair of britches for a kitten, things were gonna be okay. And so that's one of my little remembering rituals of her life and her impact. And then the fourth one is this reorientation, which when you're able to name a loss and reflect upon it, find some way to, whether in the short term or over a longer term, kind of connect some kind of bodily movement with those emotions and some image or symbol that really helps heal the connections between our inner selves and our outer world. It helps give us the courage to move forward. Now, we may not feel like we need courage on some of the smaller losses of life, but grief compounds. And that's one of the things that sometimes takes us by surprise. I don't know if you've ever had the situation where something tiny happened. Um, tiny in the grand scheme, right? Um, you saw a baby bird that had fallen out of its nest and died, and suddenly you were just overcome with tears. And you didn't know why, right? Because this bird had not meant anything to you. But likely you had an accumulation of grief in that moment. 
um, that had been building up. And this was simply where it reached its tipping point. And maybe if grief hadn't been able to be fully expressed over all sorts of other losses, maybe you were coming out of a year where there had been one change after another, one loss after another, everything from the really big things to the really small things, like you ripped your favorite pair of pants, you know, even those small tiny losses can pile up with the really big ones until eventually that dam breaks, right? And that emotion has to come out. But doing this for even the small losses helps us be able to move forward. Now, we see this in the story of the disciples as well. As they were processing there in the upper room, they realized they needed a replacement for Judas, right? Uh, there were only 11 of the 12 left, and so they went through and selected someone new to fill in for him. As they continued to process, to go through all these steps, it made them ready for that morning of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and that new began. And they were better able to embrace that, to live into that than when it came. So as we're in a season of so many transitions here, we've got graduations, we've got pastoral tr transition here at our church, we've got multiple other ones happening throughout Kirksville. We've got businesses that are closing and opening, we've got retirements and moves and endings of all different kinds of sorts. May we look for ways to pray our goodbyes. And when we recognize losses, First, let's keep our eyes open for the things that are losses. It doesn't have to be big to still be an impactful loss. I say don't make the mistake of thinking that it only counts if it's something big. If you break your favorite coffee mug, that's a loss, right? It seems small in the grand scheme, but it meant something to you. Any of those changes in our daily routines can bring about grief and loss. So recognize the endings, reflect on the experience, maybe share that with God in prayer, journal it, share it, the story with someone else. Connect emotion and body in some type of ritual kind of thing, even if it's only a one-time action. And then through that, reorient ourselves with the hope that from every ending, there will be a new beginning. And we won't know what those are, right? That's the other thing about the Pentecost story. The Holy Spirit came in ways that no one could anticipate. Nobody expected tongues of fire on top of their heads. No one expected that when they opened their mouths to speak, someone from thousands of miles away who spoke a completely different language would be able to understand, right? So we can't know where God's Spirit will be at work in the new beginnings. So whatever transitions you are in the middle of facing right now, know that you don't walk them alone. Um, we've got some wonderful books in the office. We've got a copy of this, Praying Our Goodbyes, if you'd ever like to borrow that. And um, Joyce Roop gives some very tangible ideas for some rituals for all different sorts of things that we experience in life. In addition to the big ones like deaths that we have memorial services and funerals for. So go in peace, friends, go with the love and grace of God and know that the Holy Spirit, that evidence of God's love in the world around us is always at work and that from every ending, a new beginning is on the way. Um, next week, we're going to take a little Sabbath break from our videos. It's Memorial Day week. We'll be um, posting some images um, next week on our Facebook page, and then we'll be back again at the beginning of June to continue our daily videos then. So friends, I'll see you in two weeks, and we hope to see you Sunday um, if your Memorial Day plans don't have you traveling elsewhere. So take care. <laughs>